The uh, subcommittee will come to order, and good afternoon to everyone. The Sri Lankan Civil War ended almost 10 years ago this May. The 25-year war cost an estimated 100,000 lives and displaced hundreds of thousands more. The Civil War was a brutal ethnic conflict between the majority Sinhalese and minority Tamils. Both sides, the Sri Lankan Armed Forces and the Rebel Tamil Tigers, have been credibly accused of unimaginable war crimes. To this day, justice for many of the victims remains elusive. Although many observers hoped that the reformist government, uh, President uh, Siri Sene, would increase access to justice, focus on human rights, emphasize transparency and accountability, and improve the rule of law, his administration has been criticized for having an inadequate response. Despite having run on a platform of re ethnic reconciliation, President Siri Sene has done little to meet the tie, mend the ties between the groups and the political polarization has increased among both ethnic groups. As one of our experts today, J.S. Atissa Negam, will attest, there has been no progress on holding those responsible for war crimes to account. And he will describe forced disappearances of Tamils and torture were endemic during the war. Much of this was facilitated by the Draconian Prevention of Terrorism Act, or the PTA. The PTA is yet to be repealed and is still in use by the government and security forces. Whereas most Tamils uh, nowadays simply desire some semblance of self-government and federalism, uh, their areas in the north and eastern part of the island are increasingly militarized. A concerning development in Sri Lanka is the resurgence of Sinhalese Buddhist nationalism. As one of our expert witnesses today, Dr. Michael Jerryson, will describe, this particularly virulent strand of nationalism preaches exclusion of other ethnic and religious minorities with Buddhist fundamentalists in groups such as the BBS, saying this is not a multi-religious country, this is a Sinhalese country. What of the minority groups such as the predominantly Hindu Tamils then? Or the Muslims who constituted a distinct minority? Or the Christians who could either be Sinhalese or Tamil? If the character of Sri Lanka is solely Buddhist and Sinhala, there is little room for these ethnic and religious minorities to thrive, and reconciliation will remain a far off goal. Unfortunately, the trend is heading in the opposite direction. In local elections in February of this year, a newly formed Buddhist nationalist party gained 45% of the vote, beating the government coalition combined. Furthermore, in March of this year, Sinhalese mobs engaged in an anti-Muslim pogrom after a local dispute forcing the president to declare a state of emergency. Sri Lanka's stability is of critical importance to the United States national interests. Strategically located in the sea lanes linking the Persian Gulf to East Asia, this island nation has, been, has seen a spike in recent activity by the Chinese. China's st strategy globally is one of indebting countries and binding them in servitude so it can extract resources so it is safe to say that Beijing's initiatives will not emphasize ethnic reconciliation uh, and or human rights. This presents the United States with an opportunity to stand up for, the, for justice and the rule of law and to oppose China's malign influence. After a brutal war that costed an unconscionable loss of life, we must do better to help Sri Lanka get on the right page again country has, has promise, and the people deserve better. Once all sides recognize this, this island nation will finally have some semblance of peace. I'd like to now introduce our distinguished witnesses, uh, beginning first with uh, J.S. Tisa Nave Gum, who was an English language journalist in Sri Lanka for over 20 years. In 2008, he was arrested for writing critically against the Sri Lankan government and sentenced to 20 years imprisonment tortured and imprisoned for 675 days. He was released due to an international outcry against his unjust imprisonment. He now lives in the United States. He was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard and the Reagan Fussell Fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy. Named a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International, he was awarded the International Press Freedom Award 
by the Committee to Protect Journalists in 2009, the Peter Mackler Award for Courageous and Ethical Journalism in 2009 as well, and the British Press Freedom Award, uh, Foreign Journalist of the Year in 2010. He now contributes to Foreign Policy Magazine and Asian, uh, and Asian Correspondent, among other publications. We welcome him to the subcommittee and eagerly await his testimony. We'll then hear from Dr. Michael Jerryson, who is a professor of religious studies at Youngstown State University, an expert on religious conflict. He is the co-founder and co-chair of the Comparative Approaches to Religion and Violence through the American Academy of Religion. Dr. Jerryson has studied and written on Buddhist fundamentalism extensively. His latest publication, If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Buddhism, Politics, and Violence. Dr. Jerryson is also a former Peace Corps volunteer in Mongolia. We welcome him to the subcommittee and again look forward to his uh, insights. Finally, we'll hear from, uh, doc, uh, from uh, David Crane, who, Professor Crane, who is, is a professor of practice at Syracuse University School College of Law. From 2002 to 2005, Professor Crane was the founding chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, an international war crimes tribunal appointed uh, to that position by Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan. Serving with the rank of Under Secretary General, Professor Crane's mandate was to prosecute those who bore the greatest responsibility for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other serious violations of international human rights committed during Sierra Leone's civil war in the 1990s. An expert on international criminal law, international humanitarian law, and national security, he founded Impunity Watch, a law review and public service blog. He was, has briefed the Foreign Affairs Committee several times before, uh, notably in 2014 with the Syrian army defector Caesar, an alias of course, on war crimes committed by the Assad regime. He's also been a frequent uh, provider of insight and testimony to this subcommittee, uh, especially on the importance of establishing ad hoc tribunals like the one that he so nobly led. I would point out parenthetically that the prosecutions that he led uh, led to Charles Taylor, uh, the president of Liberia, getting 50 years, sentenced to 50 years at The Hague uh, for his horrific crimes, and that would not have been possible without David Crane's leadership. So just very grateful for that leadership. Then we'll hear from John Sifton, who I understand is stuck in some traffic and will be here momentarily. Uh, serves as an Asian advocacy director at Human Rights Watch. He works on South and Southeast Asia, East Asia, the Middle East, and East Africa. John Sifton began working at Human Rights Watch in 2001, first as a researcher in the Asia Division, focusing on Afghanistan and Pakistan, and then as the senior researcher on terrorism and counterterrorism. He also founded a public interest investigation firm, One World Research, which he directed from, right on cue, uh, he directed from 2007 to 2010, in 2000 and 2001, Mr. Sifton worked for the International Rescue Committee, primarily in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And in 99, he worked as a refugee advocacy organization in Albania and Kosovo. We welcome him and again look forward to his uh, remarks as well. Uh, Mr. Tisa Negam, uh, the floor is yours. I wish to thank Chairman Chris Smith, Ranking Member Karan Bass, and other members of the subcommittee for hosting this hearing on Sri Lanka this afternoon. My remarks are a summary of the written statement submitted to this subcommittee, and I request that my full statement be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered, and that would be for everyone on the panel, and any extraneous material you'd like to include as well will be made a part of the record. Thank you. Uh, the Sri Lanka government and the rebel LTT were accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity at the end of the civil war in 2009. The best starting point to address the current human rights situation in Sri Lanka is by discussing what the present government pledged to the US and the international community. The present government was formed in January 2015 after the election defeat of authoritarian president Mahinda Rajapaksa. 
In September 2015, it accepted human rights violations had occurred during the Civil War. It proposed four transitional justice mechanisms to provide justice and lasting peace, which were incorporated into the UN Human Rights Council Resolution 30 stroke 1. This resolution was co-sponsored by the United States and Sri Lanka. Then Secretary of State John Kerry placed a seal of approval on this agreement by declaring, and I quote, this resolution marks an important step towards a credible transitional justice process, owned by Sri Lankans and with the support and involvement of the international community. Close quotes. However, progress on the, on the promises made have been dismal. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid al Hussein, said in March this year, and I quote, I regret the absence of meaningful progress. It is urgent for the sake of the victims that progress be made on accountability and transitional justice. Close quotes. Let me elaborate on enforced disappearances where, while setting up structures, Sri Lanka has failed to build trust among its people. Out of the four transitional justice mechanisms that Sri Lanka promised, only the, the Office of Missing Persons, or OMP, has been established. However, while doing so, Sri Lanka has decided to ignore the most affected people, the families of the disappeared. The stated needs of families of the disappeared in the North are simple. One, they want the role of the state agencies, the LTT rebels, and paramilitary groups acknowledged in the disappearance of their family members. Two, they want justice. And three, they want to determine what that justice would be. The OMP does not serve those needs. It cannot try perpetrators. The, and only under very limited circumstances can it refer cases to law enforcement authorities. It is because of the government's unresponsiveness that many of the families of the disappeared want to boycott the OMP now. For families of the disappeared, the most egregious form of enforced disappearances is the fate of their loved ones whom they handed over to the military at the end of the war in 2009 and never saw again. As one mother, Mrs. Pushpambal, said last week while protesting the OMP, and I quote, we are not here to speak about the missing. We are here to speak about our children who we took by the hand and gave to your military. Close quotes. Since February 2017, family members of Sri Lanka's North have been protesting every day, hoping their government will hear them. Finally, when President Sirisena met them, the families asked for the list of those who had been handed over to the military. The president promised to give them a list in two days, but defaulted. After the final meeting, Mrs. Yogarasa Kanagaranjini, whose son was disappeared, said, and I quote, today, we lost faith in this government, but we will continue our unremitting struggle for our loved ones. Close quotes. Finally, I would like to say I would I would like to briefly touch on the issue of torture in Sri Lanka. Torture has continued even after the new government took office in 2015. The UN Special Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights, Ben Emerson, said after his visit to Sri Lanka in 2017, and I quote. 80% of suspects arrested under the flawed anti-terror legislation in late 2016 had reported torture. UK-based organizations have documented several cases in, of torture in 2016 and 2017, and their reports are available to this committee. Studies have shown that impunity for perpetrators of past crimes and continuing human rights violations are risk factors to trigger future atrocities. An example in Sri Lanka was the violence against Muslims in February, February this year. Sections of the police and STF, who have been accused of torture in the past, abetted ferocious Sinhala Buddhist mobs who were attacking Muslims. While the future of Sri Lanka looks grim at this point, all is not lost. There is a silver lining. The affected citizens are doing their best to hold their government's government accountable but they need the support of the United States to ensure their government keeps its promises made to them.
The United States remains well placed to use its good offices to persuade the Sri Lanka government to abandon its policy of protecting the military. And the time for the US to act is now. <coughs> Recommendations. One, use the Global Magnitsky Act to sanction individuals accused of wartime atrocities. Two, use the power of appropriations to ensure human rights violations end and hold Sri Lanka accountable. And three, Use congressional oversight to see that the Lehi law stringently vets individuals and military units involved in wartime atrocities and ensure that US tax dollars are not used for training those units in the US, in Sri Lanka, or in a third country. Thank you. And thank you so very much for your testimony. I'd like to now ask Dr. Jerryson if you proceed. I'd like to thank the Chairman Chairman Smith and the distinguished members of the committee. Uh, the task I was asked was to identify how we could avoid the escalation and elevation of violence in Sri Lanka. As a scholar of religion and violence, my goal is not to make prescriptive claims about a religion, but to examine it on the ground. I want to also alert that I have been targeted by both Buddhist and Muslim groups in the past in my life. It's in jeopardy of this, so I have no leans one way or another in, this, in these reflections. Religion has a powerful impact on the way people see things. It creates a worldview, a way of how we see what's right and wrong, what we should do. And oftentimes, it can override human rights concerns. And I believe this has been happening in Sri Lanka for quite some time. I won't read the entire uh, submission I have, but I'd like to read some excerpts of it. As was mentioned before, the Buddhist nationalist rhetoric has been wedded to violence during the Sri Lankan Civil War and its aftermath. The role of Sinhala Buddhism in the recent anti-Muslim violence suggests that this dominance has a pattern of harmful effects on Sri Lankan's minority communities. And let me add also that dominance doesn't simply affect adversely those who don't have a lot of power, but also those who do have power in both harmful and beneficial ways. National economic and political instability makes visible the systemic inequality. It also inflames tensions. This religious ethno stratification engenders a society easily unmoored by ethno-religious conflict. The recent violence in February and March of this year, which began when four Muslims attacked a Buddhist driver, is but a recent example. Sri Lankan society is also vulnerable to ethno-religious rhetoric. We've seen this uh, news surge of this and rise with social media and Facebook posts that seem to inflame this. After Buddhist propaganda on Muslim halal conspiracies, the imminent Islamification of Sri Lanka, um, taglines such as calling Muslims Ganabila, which in Sinhalese in, in Sri Lanka means monsters, widespread riots have taken place. The power behind Buddhist propaganda are the Sri Lankan Buddhist monks. The more public and vocal conservative monks have stoked Sinhala Buddhist fears and angers of minority and marginalized identities. This behavior is distinctly modern. Prior to British colonialism, Buddhist monks legitimate Sri Lankan's governments. However, they did not directly participate in any political system. This historical role explains the Sri Lankan Buddhist monks' symbol as society's moral foundation, and they're still looked upon in this way. So when Buddhist monks speak out publicly, they don't do so only as Buddhist vo voices, but also as political moral authorities. We've seen a rise in Buddhist monastic political participation. Monks in mass became active during the 26 year Civil War. In 2004, Buddhist monks formed the Chatika Hela Uramaya, the JHU, the National Heritage Party. The political candidates were Buddhist monks, nine of them won seats in parliament. And as you mentioned before, Chairman, this has been even in a rise this year. Now, while some Sri Lankan monks have called on more pluralistic policies and rhetoric, there has been a political consolidation of conservative Buddhist monks, such as the JHU. In its inaugural year of activity, the JHU called on the extermination of the LPPE. Uh, they did not want to have any negotiations. Shortly after the Civil War, two Buddhist monks broke off from the JHU and formed a new organization called the Badabala Sena, the Buddhist power force. And within a year, the Badabala Sena shifted the rhetoric from the Tamils to Muslims as a threat for the entire country. When I interviewed founders of the Badabala Sena, it had been only two weeks since the co-founder, Janasa Tero, had delivered an emotional, intense speech that triggered Buddhist riots and attacks on Lufgama. His colleague, Dalanta, explained that Badabala Sena's reasons for the fears of Muslims, saying, quote, we want Sinhalese united in a Sinhalese government. We want protection. We were protecting Theravada Buddhism for the last 2,300 years, and today, Theravada Buddhism is in the West and with the Sinhalese. But the Sinhala race may be around only for the next 40 years. 
And this is repeated rhetoric, the idea of the fear that they're going to be obliterated. The Singha will be obliterated and true Buddhism will be obliterated in the process. Now for Talanta, the Singha Buddhists may enjoy a 69% majority compared to the 8% Muslim minority, but Sri Lankan Buddhism is a global minority in their views. He and his organization consider their efforts to defend Sri Lankan Buddhism necessary for its very survival. Now, the Sri Lankan government has taken very little action against the Battle of Balasena. However, last week, the Sri Lankan government jailed Janas Otero for citing violence against Muslims, or for him citing, inciting violence against them. Reuters, Reuters journalist Ranga Sira reports that Janas Otero told reporters as he boarded the bus to take him to prison, quote, I have done my duty towards this country. Why should I regret? So conservative Buddhist monastics such as Janas Otero and the Battle of Balasena see themselves as true to Sri Lanka because of protecting Sinhala Buddhism at the expense of minorities, ethnic and religious. Their decisions require a heightened level of accountability. My recommendations are as follows. Recent human rights abuses in Sri Lanka are a result of a larger and more his historic, systematic ethno-religious problem. To reduce the potential for devolving into another period of civil strife, I recommend the U.S. Congress support the Sri Lankan government to increase efforts to identify its democratic processes with pluralism, to commission a neutral parties, comprehensive review of the public educational materials from the national to the local for any ethno-religious biases, and as Buddhist monastics become more political, to encourage their government to support the judicial branch in policing their actions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to now recognize Professor Crane. Uh, thank you, Chairman Smith. It's, uh, again, my pleasure to be in front of uh, you and the uh, distinguished uh, committee that you chair, along with uh, all of the members who uh, uh, we have worked together for, for almost two decades, uh, uh, bringing justice to the oppressed. Uh, I have submitted my comments, and so you have put them in the record. I will not go through those. I'd just like to make a, a few important points, particularly related to justice and the involvement of Congress in the United States related to uh, the tragedy that took place uh, for uh, between 1983 and 2009. Like my colleague here, I approach this with uh, uh, nothing more than neutrality. Uh, I have been doing this for almost 40 years as far as uh, advising and investigating and prosecuting those who commit mass atrocities. The conflict that took place, we've seen law of armed conflict violations, war crimes, crimes against humanity uh, committed on all sides. Uh, that's a given. Uh, we can talk about that in further questioning, uh, but uh, let's just use this as a baseline that all parties committed violations of both domestic and international law. International efforts uh, to try to bring the parties together uh, have been largely neutral at best and uh, a failure uh, most of the time, and that is uh, because of the long-term uh, uh, challenges that go with long-term guerrilla conflict. Sri Lanka will never be at peace, a sustainable peace, unless there's both truth and justice uh, through some type of truth commission, reconciliation, as well as some type of justice mechanism, either domestically, regionally, or internationally. Uh, in my mind, uh, with all of this experience and have studied and worked with and and dealt with on a practical level these types of issues, uh, the short and medium term uh, outlook for any type of uh, truth or justice uh, is bleak at best. Uh, I see little to no U.S. ability to influence any of the parties uh, to bring them to the table to, to talk in a constructive uh, and just-like way. Perhaps in the long term there may be some political openings and sunlight that uh, will appear uh, on this uh, beautiful land which I have walked uh, uh, for many weeks, particularly exploring the and visiting uh, all of the battlefields of that last four months in 2009 as a member of a panel of experts uh, looking into potential war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, my suggestion would be this, Mr. Chairman, in conclusion is that uh, your committee, uh, the committee headed by Chairman Royce and uh, Congress at writ large, uh, as well as the U.S. government, to first show empathy 
uh, a recognition of the pain on all sides. If we lock ourselves into a narrative on either side, then we are starting off on the wrong foot. I would also uh, encourage engagement. Uh, despite the challenges that we currently have as, uh, as a nation that seems to be pulling away from the very fundamentals that established this country, uh, particularly in the human rights realm, which we have led for so many years, uh, we still need to be engaged with Sri Lanka uh, at all levels, both uh, economically, socially, culturally, politically, and practically, uh, and engage all parties. We also should be uh, encouraging uh, to ensure that uh, dialogue uh, takes place, both at the local, uh, regional, and international efforts to move the parties uh, in a way or to a realization that the only real future uh, for this war-torn land uh, is through compromise, discussion, uh, and accountability. And then, of course, uh, I concur with uh, my colleague at the end of the table, uh, the real ability of the United States to uh, draw attention is economic persuasion, both uh, soft and hard uh, persuasion. Uh, we do have some influence. Uh, they're interested in our business, uh, but that business comes with some type of uh, quid pro quo. Uh, so that will conclude my remarks, and I look forward to your questioning, sir. Thank you very much, <coughs> Professor Crane. Um, uh, John Sif Sifton. Thank you. Thank you for providing Human Rights Watch the uh, opportunity to testify also. Um, more than nine years after the conflict, uh, you know, the people of Sri Lanka are still struggling to rebuild their country's democratic institutions, but also obtain justice for the crimes that uh, were committed during the conflict. Um, you know, it's, it's only after President Saracena was elected in 2015 that the government really began to take more seriously um, the, the work that needed to be done to address past abuses. But this, this came about because of intense pressure from minority Tamil and Muslim communities and, and local activists, but also from strong pressure from concerned countries, including the U.S. The U.S. played a huge role in convincing the government to engage with the U.N. Human Rights Council. And I'm going to talk about the U.N. Human Rights Council a little later. Um, I think we've heard, you know, that we all know that the LTTE committed horrific abuses during the conflict, sectarian massacres, political assassinations, executing detainees, uh, using child soldiers, and as we documented, you know, terrorizing ethnic Tamils uh, there and abroad to raise money for their operations. The Sri Lankan security forces, uh, for their part, committed countless arbitrary detentions, extrajudicial killings, and forced disappearances. Uh, but the abuses at the end of the war were obviously among the, the worst of all. And um, between indiscriminately shelling civilians, using human shields, and killing uh, surrendered combatants and, and other Tamil men who surrendered at the war's end, it, it was a horrific time. And that's why there was so much pressure by the U.S. at the Human Rights Council. Um, you know, the two resolutions since 2015, setting up these four different mechanisms, the Special Court for Alleged war crimes, reparations, Office of Missing Persons, the Truth and Reconciliation Office. You know, those were great resolutions and it marked a huge progress. Unfortunately, as we've already heard, it's really only the Office of Missing Persons that's up and running and even their work has not really shown a lot of, pro uh, shown a lot of fruit. Um, the, the reparations process has been very slow. There was a bill, but you know, it's still stalled out. But um, most worrying of all is that there's no progress that's really been made on creating a special court, and you know, the, both the president and the prime minister have all but said that there never will be a court, and that's a huge tragedy that I think they should be criticized for a lot. But this brings me to the issue of the Human Rights Council. Um, you know, when we think about our recommendations, what needs to be done on this uh, issue, obviously U.S. pressure is a big um, point of leverage, and we, we urge members of Congress and administration officials to keep pressuring us. But you know, when I drafted my testimony, I had not yet watched Ambassador Haley's comments yesterday withdrawing the U.S. from the Human Rights Council, and it really just changes everything that I was going to say. Um, I also had not read the letter that Ambassador Haley sent to my organization and Amnesty International this morning, specifically blaming us for their withdrawal, saying that we had sided with Russia and China to sabotage their efforts at reform. 
The response within Human Rights Watch this morning to that letter was shocking. Uh, this country, Sri Lanka, was among the ones we worked with the U.S. the closest to create resolutions to address the country's human rights problems. And we found that letter to be not just an insult to us and our work and our work together with U.S. officials, but an insult to the people of Sri Lanka, to North Korea, to Burma, and other places where the U.S. has worked together. And so I hope one thing that can come out of this hearing is that members of Congress can press Ambassador Haley on why she made this disastrous, short-sighted, and frankly childish decision to withdraw from the Human Rights Council yesterday. Going forward, I think the U.S. could still use its role at the Council, even if it's not a member, to urge the next resolution in March of 2019 to find fault with Sri Lanka and say, what is going on here? You've agreed to do these four things, and you haven't done them. Unfortunately, if the U.S. is not going to be in Geneva to do that, it will fall to other countries, and that is, a, that is a terrible indictment of this administration's commitment to promoting human rights. I'm sorry that this issue had to sideline you know, the hearing about Sri Lanka. I would be glad to talk more about the Sri Lanka problems in particular, but I had to address this issue with the Human Rights Council. I have a written version of my testimony, which includes the uh, World Report chapter from Human Rights Watch's 2018 World Report on Sri Lanka, and I'd ask that it be entered into the record. Oh, without objection, so, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sifton. Let me uh, just begin, you know, the, um, the Office of Missing Persons and, and Mr. Uh, Tisa Nigama, you were very, very critical of that and pointed out that uh, the families or some of the families, maybe you said many of the families, uh, said that they will boycott the Office of Missing Persons, uh, set up uh, to probe disappearances. If all of you perhaps could focus on the shortfalls, what needs to be done to uh, fix it, and uh, again, what pressure might, might we bring? I mean, missing persons, I mean, I, I've held hearings, have done site visits all over the world, uh, even during the, the war in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, that was, you know, the, the issue of missing persons was a huge, still is, huge issue at the time. Uh, our own POW MIAs in, in North Korea, as well as in Vietnam, um, was, uh, I mean, the first speech I gave on the floor of the House in 1981 was about uh, our missing in Vietnam that we did not get a full accounting for. It seems to me that, you know, that is a, the brokenness of the families, you know, asking for that basic information really needs to be uh, pressed very hard. So if, if all of you could speak to that. Because obviously the, the families probably thought this would work and they have been disappointed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, let me start by saying a few words about the what led to the OMP. Uh, as I said, it was one of the one of the proposals made by the Sri Lanka government at the UN Human Rights uh, Human Rights Council meeting in 2015 in Geneva. Basically, what they was what the OMP was supposed to do was to look not only, uh, well, was supposed to look into the missing, uh, into missing persons across the board. But particularly, it was supposed to look into disappearances. When, but when the, but when it started, the whole process of setting it up, when that started, there were a lot of issues that came up, which led to what coming, what came out finally being a truncated or a crippled version of what it ought to have been. What the people, the, the, uh, the, the families of the disappeared wanted was not only that the OMP would look into finding out the truth about the disappearances. Because in the case of many people, as I said, who had handed over their children and their loved ones to the military, at the end of the war, they didn't need much information as to what happened to them. They saw their children being, or their husbands being handed over to the military, and then they disappeared. What they wanted was justice. This is not to preclude the fact that they didn't want to know about what happened to them eventually, but that was only one of the issues. What they wanted was justice. And if you see the way the Office of Missing Persons has been now 
uh, established. The, the law establishing the OMP excludes justice, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Office of Missing Persons, uh, the power to, 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 uh, the, to, uh, to punish perpetrators. That is because law, the Section 31 says that whatever arises from the investigations of the Office of Missing Persons will not give rise to civil or criminal proceedings. Secondly, it says that they are, I mean, the, the whole law is a bit confused. It also says that if the, the OMP wants, it can hand over some of the investigative material to a court of law. But that again, there are caveats. It says that it is only if there is no social or other problems or problems to the, to the nearest relatives arising from that. Now, just imagine if a military officer is accused of war crimes, and if that matter goes to court, you can be pretty sure from uh, what uh, uh, Professor Jerison also described, with the whole singular Buddhist ethos being what it is, there is, going to be a, there is going to be chaos. So the OMP has the discretion not to put it forward to the court of law. Now that is completely against what the people, especially the victims, want. So therefore, while the the the, the um, uh, while the victims do want to know what happened to their loved ones, and that is assuming that the OMP at least uh, does that function properly, one of the other things that they have been asking for is justice, which the structure and the and the and the near, uh, and the character of the OMP will not allow them to, uh, allow it to pro to provide. Thank you. A, a brief word about the, um, it, it, it's pretty clear that out of the menu of the four things that have been proposed to the resolutions that the government uh, obviously prefers things that are less likely to cause um, high level officials to worry that they be held accountable. And so reparations and the Office of Missing Persons has been more appetizing to the leadership as things that can be done that won't have that impact. And yet not even these things appear to have been done. Um, one warning sign is that a lot of families are now telling us that they won't accept reparations unless there's some progress made on justice or accountability or truth telling. That they simply won't take the money. Um, that may be a, a, a sign that you know this this could boil over in coming weeks and months. But the other warning sign is that the debate over accountability can have political ramifications. Um, you know, among the people who may run for office in the next election is Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who was defense minister at the time of the worst abuses in, in the war, um, and also incidentally a US citizen who's under investigation by the Justice Department for those alleged war crimes. Um, he's been implicated. That's a huge uh, political ramification right there in the sense that if he's held accountable, that could lead him to um, engage in have more political support. If he's not held accountable, that in turn could uh, provide a reason for why the ruling party may fail in the next election because they, the northern vote on which they were so dependent uh, will not be delivered for them because of the profound disappointment in the government in not holding anybody accountable. Just uh, one, one point, you know, the, uh, the issue of justice, which all victims, and it's at the end of the day all about victims. What they want is truth and they want justice. They want to tell the world their story, what happened to them, whether it be before a small body like a truth commission or an international or a, a local court. But at the end of the day, particularly in Sri Lanka, but it's also proven to be in, uh, in my practice in international criminal law for, for over two decades, is that the bright red thread of all of this is politics. It will be a political decision someday that someone's going to say we've got to do something about this, and that time is not present. So we have to just understand that as a, as a word of caution. Uh, w when that happens, I have no idea, but it will be a political uh, shift that will cause people to begin to move towards some of the 
that four-cornered stool which they put in place in 2015, 2016, which has all the possibilities, but the politics of it uh, weaken that whole structure. Let me just ask you, Mr. Crane, after the Civil War, the Sri Lankan government put together the Commission of Inquiry uh, with the intention of investigating both the Sri Lankan military and the Tamil Tigers. Can you describe your role in that commission? And if you could, um, how effective has it been? How disappointing has it been? And you also have s suggested in your testimony that a court similar to the one that you uh, so effectively led in Sri Lanka, uh, in, um, in uh, Sierra Leone, uh, be you know, uh, established uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, how realistic is that? Do you think that's something that could be achieved? Well, thank you for those questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I was, a, uh, I was uh, on the panel, I was on the uh, a panel of experts with Sir Desmond De Silva and Sir Jeffrey Nice and myself advising uh, that initial commission looking at what the possibilities were related to war crimes and crimes against humanity took place. I was brought in in uh, uh, 2014 uh, to advise that body, uh, which we did. Uh, we found that, uh, as many of the inquiries have already found, but unequivocally, neutrally, and with the great depth, found that international and domestic crimes uh, were replete. We focused uh, particularly on a lot of the dust that was in the air related to those final four months. And the three of us literally walked that campaign all the way to the beach, uh, that the last day of, uh, of uh, the, the conflict, for lack of a better term. Uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, there are uh, accountability on both sides. Uh, I could certainly go into uh, uh, my professional sense of this neutrally as to those four months, but uh, at the end of the day, the commission, uh, well, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, the, the president that had set that up uh, literally three weeks after I left Sri Lanka was uh, thrown out of office and it just disappeared into a, uh, a cloud. So at the end of the day, uh, I would have to honestly say to, uh, to you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, really it it just disappeared. There was no, uh, no uh, uh, concrete ability to build from that. Uh, to answer your second question, yes, of course, when the political decision is made to do something, certainly a hybrid international court such as Sierra Leone is certainly a possibility. Uh, and it's an encouraging possibility because uh, we could involve all parties, which is what the Sierra Leone court was. Uh, it was an international court, but we also had uh, members of the country in key and significant uh, positions and judges, deputy prosecutor, deputy uh, uh, registrar, what have you. Uh, yeah, you know, the history of the Special Court for Selling shows that a, a hybrid international war cri tribunal works and can be done efficiently and effectively. Uh, and yes, certainly uh, that is a possibility. You know, really, at the end of the day, uh, the, the, the real possibilities here are either a, a internationalized Domestic court, I, don't, I just don't see a domestic court happening. Potentially an internationalized domestic court or a hybrid international court of some sort with variations uh, at a time yet to be determined when a political climate and decision is made that that might be something that would be uh, useful to the people of Sri Lanka. But again, I have to underscore uh, that it will be a political decision to do that. Yes. To add to this, too, and I, I applaud uh, Professor Crane and his suggestions, uh, there's a lot of delicacy right now remaining with the Sarasena administration uh, in that if they push too much in one direction, they're going to lose a lot of political support. Well, the Rajapaks are waiting in the wing right now, who's been much more supportive of the Badabadasena and other groups besides the Badabadasena. This is going to be, I think, a very careful approach I think we should be aware of. Um, the Badabadasena has been training young monastics since 2013. They've been trying to change the way in which people see what it, what it means to be a Sinhala Buddhist and what does it mean to be a Sri Lankan. And in the end, I think it's gonna have to be the long game, not the short game here. Thank you. Uh, while I agree with everyone here that politics will be a very important part in determining when this uh, just when a, a credible justice mechanism is going to be set up. 
I also feel that the Sri Lanka government is using certain myths to push the fact that politics is not conducive to bring about a solution at this point of time. I'm not saying that it can happen this at this point of time, but I think it can be expedited. But that the Sri Lanka government, by putting forward some of these myths, is trying to delay it for obvious reasons. Now, one of the main things that the Sri Lanka government says, and I uh, believe uh, uh, Professor Jerison also referred to it, is about Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who was the former defense secretary, and uh, who is, uh, and the general myth is that if he's arrested or if he's accused of anything, there is going to be a huge outcry in the country, and more than that, that there is going to be a coup uh, in the military. Now, this story has been there from about 2009. First, first and foremost, they said that Field Marshal Fonseca, who was at that time, the, who, well, he's known as the butcher of the North, because he led the military and uh, he is accused of various war crimes. That anyone who touches him would end up uh, killed, or that they would, or that they, they would be victimized by the regime. Uh, 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 yeah, by the regime and by the Singhala Buddhist people. But then he was arrested. He was put behind bars, and then he came back. The military did not uh, uh, did not revolt. Then they said, if Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who is with the Secretary of Defense, if something happens to him, that there would be a huge outcry and there would be a coup. Gotabaya Rajapaksa go, comes and goes to the to courts very regularly because he's charged with various crimes, but they're not war crimes, but corruption issue. And the military has not uh, erupted. They have not, uh, there is no coup. Thirdly, there is a, uh, there is Air Commodore DMK Disanayaka, who is, who is uh, uh, sorry, he's Commodore, he's a, uh, he's, a, he's a naval officer. He's also a senior officer. But, uh, who, who has been implicated in the disappearance of 11 people, 11, uh, and, 11 uh, and some of them are young kids. He too has been, he's now on bail, but he was arrested. And there was no uh, um, outcry or no coup or no, uh, no, it was no big deal. So while I agree with everyone here that politics will play a role in when this is going to be set up, I think the government of Sri Lanka propagates these myths to push it as much as much backwards as possible. Thank you. Yes. Professor. Thank you again for your time. Uh, I, as we were sitting here having this important discussion, things come to mind. Uh, I, you know, I've been sitting here thinking about this uh, very intently uh, for the past week and uh, in my experience with working with the government of uh, Sri Lanka and others and meeting uh, the president all the way down to various individuals. You know, I think what they're doing right here right now is uh, a waiting game. Uh, they are, uh, it's, a, it's a slow roll. They'll give and take here and there to, uh, to ease pressure. Uh, but they're looking at over time uh, that the interest in accountability uh, for Sri Lanka will wane. Uh, because again, the placement uh, geopolitically of, of Sri Lanka itself uh, puts it right in the middle of uh, three major powers. Uh, particularly India and China, but also uh, 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 on and off interest uh, by the United States in trying to develop an influence uh, in that part of the world. And so they're banking on their, uh, their the other uh, geopolitical aspects of where they are versus, uh, and just waiting this out uh, uh, and uh, seeing what the result will be, adjusting as it goes. Uh, maybe they'll be forced to do something, but I think they're in a waiting game at this point, Mr. Chairman. Let me ask you if I could. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tisa Nagam had focused on torture and the fact that the Prevention of Terrorism Act, dr the draconian PTA, um, not only permitted arbitrary detention, but allowed confessions that were admissible um, through torture. I wonder if you could speak to why the government has not dismantled, eviscerated, done away with, uh, repudiated this terrible law. Uh, thank you. Well, I think the very simple answer 
is that they don't want to do that because it would take away a very important tool that the government has to, pu to punish people uh, whom, they, whom they think are, are culpable or at least who, who have been charged on, uh, on, 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 on human rights uh, on various violations, but who can be charged as, uh, uh, as terrorists. One of the things that we have to understand is that from the time the PTA was uh, was put out, uh, was uh, was was made into law in 1979, not only were people who were uh, charged uh, who who had who had who had whose offences were cognizably terrorist offences, but even people who expressed dissent, people whose whose speech and whose actions should have been uh, uh, safeguarded and, and protected as legitimate as only criticizing the government or the people in power were made to look terrorist because the way the law is couched, the way the law is written is so broad that it includes almost anything as an act of terror. And once you do that, you can uh, there are various things that you can use, including confessions. Now, one of the one of the things that, uh, uh, the, the, uh, including confessions, which is made admissible under the PTA, to uh, charge these people. And torture is is related to that. In the case of many of the uh, many of the uh, uh, many suspects who are taken in. Usually what happens is that they are tortured. In fact, uh, Ben Emerson, as I said, said that 80% of the people who had been, uh, who had been taken in, in, uh, in between, uh, uh, between uh, 2015 and 2016 had complained of torture. Now, the problem here is that this is a way of, uh, of suppressing dissent and, and legitimate uh, 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 um, uh, people who are legitimately expressing something against the government. Now, I was a victim in that sense. I was a journalist, and I didn't go around carrying a gun or killing people, but I was charged under the Prevention of Terrorism Act, and I was jailed under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. I was arrested and jailed under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. So I think that is the main cause, how you can use this overbroadly uh, um, defined terrorism uh, in the PTA to keep to keep and discipline a society. That is why the, the government is keeping this, and that is why it's also keeping torture, because you can torture people into making confessions, which you can use. Thank you. Uh, just to direct the committee's attention to two facts. One is that um, the special rapporteur visited in July 2017 and found that torture is continuing apace and routine. We issued a report about the PTA uh, as well f a few months ago in which we documented several major cases of torture of PTA detainees. But it's important to recognize not only have they failed to repeal it, these draft texts for new versions are even worse and they br contain these broad definitions of political activity as terrorism that are highly troubling. I think it's good to pivot here to talk about how the U.S. can voice its displeasure with this situation. If we're not going to have the Human Rights Council as a as a, a vehicle uh, anymore, then the United States at least can use its embassy uh, to voice these concerns and its spending power through appropriations. I think it's a good opportunity that there's a new ambassador coming in. We've worked with her very closely in Nepal and other places, and it's just, I mean, not to say anything bad of the current ambassador, Atul is a wonderful um, ser servant of the, of the U.S., and uh, we wish him well. But the, the next ambassador uh, coming in like this can bring a new approach, a little tougher, and say to these, uh, this government, look, we have a problem. There's a lot of restrictions on what we can do with you militarily, you know, our spending on law enforcement, counterterrorism, the Leahy law, all these, and a lot of this will be uh, made better if you start reforming. 
And if you show progress on human rights and accountability, it will make it easier for Congress to approve funding for more and more things, and we can have joint trainings. And this addresses the issue of the sandwiching between China and India. Uh, the, I've, having been to PACOM in Honolulu, I can tell you that the, that the Pacific Command looks at Sri Lanka with, you know, salation. <laughs> they're, they're very appetizingly looking at Sri Lanka as a place where they want a closer military uh, relationship, but they can't have it because of appropriations language. So this is something the ambassador can say to them and say it in a sort of a, an offering way. We want to be closer to you, but you need to help yourself by reforming. Let me just ask you, <clears throat> I was the uh, prime sponsor of the Frank Wolf International Religious Freedom Act, which takes us further down um, the road of trying to hold uh, designated persons lists uh, the use of sanctions, which are parallel to the Global Magnitsky Act. I was the House sponsor of that. It did get passed into law by way of an amendment, which was great through the NDAA. And that is another tool, and you mentioned it, uh, Mr. Tisa Negama, Negam, uh, as something we ought to, in your s list of recommendations. Um, is it time to really pull the trigger on those kinds of tools that are in the toolbox? Yes. It seems to me. It, it, I wish it was. I wish I could say yes. The problem is that the current way in which the administration, the State Department, consider sanctions under global Magnitsky requires that the abuses in question be somewhat recent. And uh, so you would really have to focus on current bad actors um, in the last three to five years. Um, it, you cannot really make a um, successful Magnitsky petition to the government about abuses that took place in 2009. It's intensely frustrating to us as a human rights group, but that's the reality that we're dealing Especially with. Especially since the torture is ongoing. Um, right. That you could. If you identify Sri Lankan officials who are implicated in torture in the last three to five years, by all means, they should be recommended for sanctioning under... Is that something rights. that Human Rights Watch is compiling lists of people that could be held accountable? Sri Lanka is one of several countries that we've uh, recommended. On, for those names, could you convey them to this subcommittee? Uh, that would be very helpful. Yes. Professor? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I, though I would, uh, I certainly would love to see that kind of movement. I helped uh, in, the, in the Senate draft the Majinsky Act. But the point is, is that how far do we want to, how hard do we want to push right now? I agree with my colleague here. We have a new ambassador coming in. If we push too hard, what ends up happening is nothing happens. Uh, go ahead, they'll say do it, but then they'll turn to India or China and we lose that important base. And again, you remember just within a, a month, the Department of Defense did something and it rarely does change the name of a, of a combatant command uh, to the Pacific India Command, which shows you how important uh, from a military, geopolitical and military point of view they see this region. So uh, it's a delicate dance, uh, yes, altruistically, uh, that's the way to go, but I think practically speaking, uh, we need to be able to show them that we could do this, but there are other openings that might be able to allow us. Because again, it's been my experience, if you push the Sri Lankan government, it, it, and whatever the issue may be, too hard, they will dig their heels in and uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so all of a sudden we, we, we had something, and now all of a sudden we have nothing. Let me, uh, before I go to uh, one of my final questions, uh, we are joined by a constituent of mine, Balin Akuga Palan, uh, who's from uh, Mercer County. And, uh, he and his family are here today. I want to welcome them, thank them for coming. Let me just ask a couple of final questions. The state of the media or lack of media freedom uh, in Sri Lanka today, w where is it today? Can journalists write um, openly and, and critically without the fear of that knocking the door in the middle of the night? And how do we address, or how are they addressing the plight of religious and ethnic minority groups such as Christians? And before you go to your answers, uh, just let me also point out that T. Kumar is here. T. Kumar is with Amnesty International. He spent uh, over five years as a prisoner of conscience. Um, so I want to thank him for his insights. He frequently testifies before uh, this subcommittee. So I want to thank him for, for those insights, which are very much valued. But if you could speak to those issues, status of press freedom or lack of it like and the issue of uh, other minority groups and how well or poorly they're treated. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, basically, when you look at Sri Lanka's performance with, uh, um, as, far as, free press, as far as press or media freedom goes, generally it has improved 
from what it was in 2009 and in fact from 2015. And when you look at the RSF's index, for instance, Sri Lanka has come from about the 162nd position to something like 142. So when you look at it from that point of view, there is people can write, people can say what they want and stuff like that. But I think there is a very important thing that we have to recognize. There are certain things that cannot be spoken about in, in the Sri Lankan media. And one of those is about things like war crimes and crimes against humanity and about disappearances and issues like that. So while there is much more uh, freedom to write about, gen even about general political issues, there is absolutely nothing, or I would say very little, to speak, to have an in-depth discussion on issues like war crimes, about disappearances, torture, and stuff like that. Now, I think it's very important. I mean, people might say, okay, there's just one thing. I mean, you can speak about everything else. But I think it's fundamental if Sri Lanka is to, is to reconcile, uh, 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 if its groups are going to reconcile and come together, that you have a situation where the, 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 the media is free enough to be able to, to, to discuss and have conversations on this matter. So I think there are t there, there is one, the main, main issue that does not permit this is the Prevention of Terrorism Act. The PTA does not allow you to write. I mean, if you want to write something that is critical of the government, even today, especially th something that is, that doesn't, uh, uh, something that the, uh, on, ethnic free, on ethnic reconciliation and stuff like that, it is not permitted. So this is done in two ways. In the North and East, even yesterday, someone who was covering something on the disappearances was, arrest, was harassed by the, uh, by the military. And this happens all right along. So anyone who does anything about the military, or uh, sorry, about the protests, or about any sort of or disappearances, or anything like that, uh, journalists can be harassed. They, they can be asked to give their, um, their, 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 their names of their sources. They, their, their, photo, their, their photographic equipment has been, uh, has been uh, taken away from them and stuff like that. In the South, it's different. While this happens, all with all, while all, also this happens, the other problem is that the government looks upon anybody who, in Sinhalese, or most Sinhalese who are writing about the ethnic issue and asking uncomfortable questions as type of traitors, you know? you are going against our government and our government which, uh, which uh, destroyed terrorism and, and killed off the LTT. So that project does not allow some of the, uh, some of the editors and uh, journalists who want to write, to write. And that, very importantly, uh, places self-censorship as far as the southern uh, newspaper and media people are concerned. That's so. And also the other, the third thing is that a lot of news, uh, uh, that a lot of uh, websites that speak about some of these issues are now uh, blocked in Sri Lanka, including 13 as of 2000 and, uh, 2017 December. Thank you. Mr. Garrett. Oh, yes. uh, I'll yield for the time being. I'll, I'll lay in reserve. Close to the end. Uh, yep. Uh, if any would like to touch on the how the Christians and other mi religious minority groups are being treated. I think we can look at the, I mean, there has been a rise in the persecution of Christians. Uh, they were, first off, the Tamils during the Civil War were not just all Hindus. There were Christians as well that were persecuted as, uh, during that time period. Uh, there's been an increase in persecution of Christians in Sri Lanka. Uh, not to the extent that we see Muslims being persecuted. Um, this is, I think, being a, a ripple effect throughout not just Sri Lanka, but also in South, South Asia as a whole with India as well. The mobilization of uh, Hindu Twa and uh, um, so, yes. Is there anything else uh, before we go to Mr. Garrett that any of you would like to uh, add that we have not touched upon today? just so we have a complete, comprehensive record. We 
do have a number of uh, submissions for the record, uh, test a statement by Amnesty International USA, and also um, a um, testimony from MAP. Um, so without objection, those two testimonies will be made part of the record. So I would speak briefly and begin with an apology uh, for my tardiness. And I know that Mr. Sifton in particular has raised a number of concerns as it relates to uh, the United States action with regards to the UNHRC. Uh, I would submit that uh, membership in an entity who purports to espouse particular values as it relates to basic human rights uh, and yet allows actors who are some of the most egregious violators of those values um, the positions and authority that the UNHRC has over the years almost undercuts the mission purported by the entity uh, to begin with. I would also submit, at least in the opinion of this member, that um, advocacy on behalf of human rights at the expense of, uh, of one group at the expense of human rights of another group uh, also becomes self-defeating. And so I, I certainly don't um, commend all actions as it relates to the United States with regard to the UNHRC, uh, but I understand that perpetuating the idea that the UNHRC and the membership thereof is somehow um, worthy to pass judgment wherein member states uh, like China, like Saudi Arabia, like Russia, uh, like Cuba, and in and, and, and the past Venezuela, um, <laughs> whose human rights records are far from gleaming. Um, again, undercuts the stated mission of the entity. So it's a little bit more complicated than I think perhaps it could be made. Um, with that, again, my um, sincerest apologies, and uh, I thank the chairman for the time and would yield back reserving it. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. The chair recognizes um, a good friend from California. Thank you. And, uh, Brad Sherman. I want to thank you for allowing me to participate. I'm not a member of this subcommittee. Um, but I've been very involved in uh, Sri Lanka as ranking member of the Asia Subcommittee, uh, which had its own hearing, uh, hence delaying me from being here. And um, although the uh, the war ended in 2009, Sri Lanka's northern and eastern provinces uh, have an awful lot of property controlled by the Ministry of Defense. Uh, including uh, an extensive portfolio of previously civilian properties, um, a number of businesses, uh, and multiple hotels. Is it inappropriate for these civilian properties to remain under military control uh, almost 10 years after the end of the conflict? And uh, what is the Sri Lankan government taking uh, um, steps to uh, restore civilian control? Uh, to these properties in uh, the northern and eastern provinces? Uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, originally the, these properties were, were, to, were taken over by the, gov by the government, uh, saying that this, is, this, was, this was for security related reasons. This was during the war. Uh, the, and and this happened over a period of about almost 30 years. The problem is that the war came to an end in 2009, and to your question, there is no need for the Sri Lanka government to hold on to all this amount of land. Uh, what the government says is that it needs this land to, uh, to, uh, to establish camps and uh, control the security of the area. There are a couple of problems here. The first is what I referred to in my, written st in my witness statement about militarization. First and foremost, you don't need so many, sol so many soldiers and military personnel in the North and East. Uh, according to some statistics that came out very recently, in a town called Mulatibu, the, the ratio between soldiers to civilians is two is to one. There are 130,000 people to 60,000 soldiers. So first and foremost, we don't need so many soldiers there. So you can close some of those camps. Coming down, coming back to the, uh, coming to the land itself, there are two types of land that is being held. One is state-owned land, and the other is private land. So while the government, under a lot of international and local pressure from human rights organizations and uh, stuff like that, 
are giving back land, it is nowhere near what the people want because many of those people who are not who, who want that land back, especially in the case of private owners, they are they are mostly in refugee camps. So you don't want to live as a refugee when the army is occupying your occupying your land. So uh, so while land is being given back, it is very slow uh, and not uh, in keeping with the demand of the of the rate at which people want that land to be given back. That is the first. That's the second issue. The third issue is that the government tells you, okay, right, we are giving you 20 acres or 100 acres or whatever it is. And the people go and settle there. But then the next day the military comes and says, no, no, you can't, you can't, I mean, we, we, we said that, but there are landmines here, or there are for security reasons, you can't go and live there. So those people go back. So even if there is an, if officially this land is given back, actually it is not. So in reality, those people continue to live uh, on uh, uh, in refugee camps. I so wonder if any of the other witnesses has a comment on that question, Mr. Green. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, you know, and the uh, international humanitarian law, laws of armed conflict, do uh, do recognize property seizure in a general sense, but there's got to be an appropriate, in most cases, militarily necessary reason to seize that property. And even if that is done, uh, particularly in situations like that, some type of compensatory arrangement. Uh, is made. Uh, you know, the, uh, Geneva 4 deals with the laws of occupation, and uh, of course, during conflict, a, uh, a, 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 a party to the conflict can seize property for an appropriate reason. Uh, initially, after the conflict ended, movement of military forces uh, into that part of Sri Lanka was legal and probably appropriate. But what's over a period of 10 years now is that the the militarily necessary reason for them to be doing that uh, has waned. And now all this is is really a, just a visible reminder of raw power. And, uh, and the Does it produce a, a stream of income that goes directly to the military coffers? Uh, Congressman, I, I just don't know that those facts, so I would not comment on that. That's, uh, I don't know if uh, Mr. Schiff. The assumption is that that would, that would not be a stretch. Of assumption, but let's be clear about the laws of war. The, the conflict is not underway. There is no active state of armed conflict in Sri Lanka today. It ended in 2009. Um, this year's omnibus appropriations uh, law conditions uh, U.S. economic and security aid to Sri Lanka on its government meeting certain human rights benchmarks. Uh, should we further condition our assistance to Sri Lanka? on progress on uh, human rights issues, including uh, accounting for missing persons and providing some degree of political autonomy to the Tamil minority. In uh, a Mr. perfect Schiff. world, we, that's a recommendation that we would make, but uh, honestly, not necessary in the sense that the existing law already gives tools and ammunition to the incoming ambassador and other U.S. officials to say to the Sri Lankan government, there's more that we could do if you uh, start taking actions on that activity. assumes that the executive branch and the legislative branch are agnostic as to which of them is uh, controlling American policy um, would that the executive branch always take our advice uh, we would need to put provisions into statute um, I'll ask any other witness whether you have a comment on whether it'd be important for Congress to put that uh, such conditions into statute, or uh, should we be confident that uh, the executive branch will use the tools that other statutes have given them and uh, doesn't need to be uh, told what to do in further statutes? Uh, does any, uh, any uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Crane. Yes, uh, uh, it's always a good thing to have legislation that uh, that highlights human rights and, and links it to uh, monies uh, that would be benefit of a country that is maybe violating those human rights. Uh, I think it's a decision by both the legislative branch and the executive branches, and I had mentioned this to uh, the chairman, how hard do we want to push at this moment? Uh, you would know as well as anybody in this room, uh, the Sri Lankans are very sensitive about this. If we go all out, uh, we may lose everything if we continue to engage quietly and, uh, and encourage versus uh, jam it down their throats. 
uh, then that's exactly what's going to happen. They're going to gag, and we, we're going to be back at ground zero. So uh, that's not an answer, but a caution. And I'd, I'd point out the one disadvantage we have as a legislative branch is uh, when we want to influence the executive branch, we can do that quietly, but when we want to control the executive branch, it's in a public statute, uh, which means that it's not subtle, and sometimes we should be subtle, and sometimes we should be less than subtle. With that, I uh, yield back. Thank you. Let me just ask one final question, if I could, and, and, and uh, it, the question is to you. Oh, go ahead. Why don't you? Oh, just one thing to note, if you're going to put anything into the statutes about the Tamil minorities, please also include Muslims as well. Many of them do not identify as Tamil, and they're also being persecuted this time. If you could um, elaborate, you s noted in your testimony you interviewed the founders of the BBS in the summer of 2014, um, only two weeks before uh, Nasara Thero uh, gave a speech that triggered Buddhist riots and attacks on Muslims. Um, could you elaborate on this seemingly escalating threat of this extremism? Uh, absolutely, uh, Chairman. Just to be clear, do you do you want me to uh, reflect more on the meeting or on the current escalating threat? Current escalating threat, but you obviously, having talked to them, uh, the founder back in 2014, I think would have some very useful insights. The the Buddhist nationalist groups right now in Sri Lanka are feeding off of not just themselves but also adjoining Buddhist organizations such as the Mabata and the 969 movement in Myanmar. And so they're beginning to feel more and more emboldened of the fact that they're alone, that the West is only concerned with Christians and colonial rhetoric, um, and that they have to take matters into their own hands. Well, if we speak out, if you would yield for a moment, very aggressively on the Rohingya, which obviously are in the crosshairs. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, there was actually in September of this uh, past year, there was a UN sanctioned refugee camp in Sri Lanka for Rohingya refugees that were attacked by Buddhists and Buddhist monks that were Sri Lankan. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the, the rhetoric of pointing out that Buddhism is under threat is becoming more and more, I think, solidified, more clear for many people. It's getting more traction. Um, the one small uh, silver lining is, again, the fact that John Sartero was arrested and there's rumors that he's going to be defrocked. Uh, but this is something that hopefully we can see more of. Dr. Jervis, yes. But i just add to that. I think there is, um, I, uh, with respect to what Representative Sherman said about the administration, there are some allies who are willing to be more forceful on some of these issues. that are spread a little bit thin. Uh, one of them is former Senator Brownback, who's now ambassador at large on these issues. Encouraging him to visit the country would probably be to the country's benefit in the sense that it would revitalize efforts in, at C Street and in Washington in general to really address these issues with a little bit more vigor. Take that up with them. Great idea. Uh, anything else you'd like to add before we conclude? I would like to respond to the issue of the Human Rights Council, if I may, very briefly. I, uh, there is no doubt that the Human Rights Council in Geneva is deeply flawed, but it has also given us things like the UN Commission of Inquiry on North Korea and the two resolutions that pressured Sri Lanka to do everything that they have done as inadequate as it is. Um, there was a reform process underway in Geneva. Ambassador Haley, instead of working within that process, uh, tried to lead a shortcut through the UN General Assembly where the US lacked re requisite political support uh, and where it also would have opened a Pandora's box of other amendments by bad actors, including Russia and China, that would have ended with a net result of a worse Human Rights Council. So for all those reasons, we suggested they not do this. Um, and I would submit that if the measure of a w how flawed a UN body is, is if its members have egregious human rights records, then what are we to do with the UN Security Council? Should we withdraw from that as well? <coughs> I thank you. I um, would just provide one insight from, I mean, when the Human Rights Commission, uh, its predecessor for the Human Rights Council, many of us had very, very high hopes that it would matriculate into a true, robust human rights uh, organization of, of UN member states that really had 
as close to as impeccable <coughs> records as possible. Uh, I, for one, believe that we should always stay and fight from within, but it is so egregiously flawed. The way it focuses on Israel uh, is an abomination. Uh, and it, you know, when countries like China, where torture is is absolutely pervasive and all their other human rights abuses. Uh, I've gone to the council many times, raised issues, went to the press conference that the Chinese held um, and raised these issues. They just closed down the press conference uh, and didn't want to talk any further. So, you know, hopefully withdrawal, if that's what will actually happen, will lead to some very robust introspection. Uh, I've raised issues with Prince Zed many times. I think he has made numerous mistakes. I'm sure he's well-meaning, but numerous mistakes, especially as it relates to Israel. Uh, I mean, what, how many votes are had in that council uh, that are all directed at Israel when, when so many, I mean, even, even on the issue of, of uh, killing or enabling terrorists uh, subsidized by the PLA and paying their families, pay to slay is what we call it. Uh, we recently had legislation on the floor of the House to at least ding them on some of the money. I'm going to introduce a new bill that says we will hold criminally and civilly liable uh, those at the PLA uh, who provide this blood money to, to um, uh, terrorists and to their families and also hold a position in the PLA leadership depending on how many years you spend in prison uh, when you commit a terrorist act. I mean, I, I, there were a few, and, and yet does the PLA, I know it's an organization, it's not a de facto government per se, it is a government, uh, you know, gets away with this, this murder. So uh, I think you know, I thought we should have stayed and fight fought from within, but I am shocked and dismayed how the cast of human rights abusers remain dominant uh, at the Human Rights Council. It's not much different, if at all, from the Human Rights Commission. So the hope that it's that as a replacement it would have led to a, again, a more transparent, open, aggressive, you know, this is where human rights are really done, um, didn't happen. But we'll keep fighting to, uh, to reform it. So we will keep fighting because it needs help and it will reform whether the U.S. is there or not. Gotcha. Yes. Michael. If I can add to this discussion briefly. So as I mentioned before, there's a battle of rhetoric taking place in Sri Lanka about the fact that there might be Western propaganda taking place, Western interests. Um, my concern is the timing now of this, the fact that being pulled out of the Human Rights Commission means that also the Council can also start looking at the United States and saying agendas about possible human rights problems that we have here, and that could be used as fuel for fake news and false information in Sri Lanka disregard what we have to say. So the concern is one of put out there. Mr. Chairman, so would you suggest then that if we hadn't pulled out of the UNHRC that there wouldn't be any fake news or propaganda? No, no, not at all. So in other words, we're going to get that either way, right? I mean, this is almost like I would argue given the fox the keys to the proverbial hen house. And if you wanted to have credibility, then maybe there should be some standards for membership thereon. That's a rhetorical assertion. But again, I, I have great sympathy for the administration, for the chair, for, the, for, for ranking member uh, Sherman. Uh, uh, th there's no right answer here. Having said that, as it relates to Mr. Sifton's comment to the UN Security Council, you know, there are those who would say you're absolutely correct. Right? The, the question is, what baby do you throw out with the proverbial bathwater? Having said that, if I were to review and enumerate the human rights violations of the members of the UNHRC just right now, we'd have to book another several hours, <laughs> and we do. right? That's all. I'm, I, I don't disagree with you guys. In fact, I admire you and I think you're doing the right thing, the, the, but there's no panacea here where when, wherein we go, well, if we're a member, everything will be good, and if we're not, everything will be bad. It, it, it's frustrating. One Thank you, point sorry. is that the Human Rights Council's votes on these resolutions passed by unanimous consent. So these egregious human rights actors who have, you know, caused our staff huge problems, put us in peril, uh, allowed these resolutions to go forward. So yes, it's flawed, and yes, they're egregious human rights. But, 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 but by virtue of participation, you essentially legitimize those, those edicts. That's the problem. If you turn and walk away from it, you say, we don't recognize the authority of this particular entity, right? We've seen this recently as it relates to the arbiters of what is and isn't, for example, a hate group. When you give blanket authority to a subset of individuals to determine who is bad and who is good, ultimately those individuals in a world corrupted and inhabited by fallen human beings would probably tend to err on the side of whatever agendas they harbor, right? You can know, and I do, that Israel is not perfect without agreeing with every assertion that somehow Israel is evil. I want to thank 
all of uh, my colleagues. I want to thank our very distinguished witnesses for your extraordinarily incisive and, and really illuminating testimony. It helps us to do a better job on the subcommittee, and we will be in touch with the administration on, on many of the recommendations you have made. So thank you uh, so very much. The hearing is adjourned. Got a few votes to cast. Okay.